Hello. Hey. <laughs> hi, hi everyone. Hello, everyone, thank you so much for joining us, Dina. So everyone, this is the first time we're doing an Instagram live for the project, The Last Tropical Glaciers. Thank you so very much for joining because today you're in for a treat. Today we have a fantastic guest and I'm super happy to be able to spend some time, some time with her and some time with you as well. So this is the first one of hopefully a long series of live. Um, next week, we're going to have another live, et cetera, et cetera. And this will be a great opportunity to keep track on what we're doing with the project and also for you guys to meet some of our team members. So my name is Heidi Silvestre. I'm a French glaciologist and I started the project on the last tropical glaciers, trying to raise awareness about these fantastic icy giants that we have in the tropics. And in the team, we have some incredible people such as Nina. So Nina, welcome. Thank, Thank you for you. taking the time. So where are you speaking to us from today? So I'm currently in my lab at Ohio University by myself because, <laughs> yeah, we are not allowed to work with others. So I'm in Athens. That is a small town in southeastern Ohio in the U.S. And yeah, I'm here in a rainy day. So here is a 2 p.m. So, but it's a rainy. I don't see sun. <laughs> no, that's too bad. Here in the French Alps, it's super sunny. We have a almost summer day. It's very nice. But it's nice to join us from so far away and great to see that you can actually go back to work somehow. Yeah, yeah, but secretly. Yeah, yeah, okay. No one knows. <laughs> Great. So Nina, you are truly one of the most extraordinary people I've met. No, but it, oh, it's good. absolutely fair. And I thought that people should know more about you and about your background. So can you tell us more about who you are and what you've been doing for the past couple of decades? Okay, but before I want to tell you one story because I know a couple of my friends, they always ask, how do you know Heidi? Like, how do you <laughs> met? Because she's in a friend, you are in the US, you're from Serbia. So that is so funny story. So I need to tell you guys, that's amazing. <laughs> so 2011, I went to climb uh, Mont Blanc, that is the highest peak of France by myself. And there is a one spot on the way to the top where is like so dangerous place with the all rock falling down and it's they called <laughs> Russian roulette because you never know when the rock will fall so and I was walking and I was so scared it's not that technically difficult but it's more dangerous so yeah. I walked and I saw down one human silhouette close to the <laughs> that rock fall and I was like oh gosh that is a really weird place to go to restroom but I guess someone is busy <laughs> But I was wait, but that person still stayed there. So, okay, let me check. So I went there. So I'm like, are you okay? And then <laughs> the most friendly face that I met said, yeah, I'm doing my study. I'm counting how many times will rock fall down. That was true. Yeah. And that's how that story starts. Oh my gosh. Yeah, how ago was that? That's crazy. It was almost, almost 10 years ago now, probably nine or 10 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I it's, think so. Yeah, what, you know, fate brought us together. <laughs> it was really funny, but it's true. I was studying the rock falls along the normal route to climb Mont Blanc. And, you know, I felt probably the same way seeing you on your own with your huge backpack <laughs> <laughs> reaching to the top of the mountain. And I thought, wow, I want to be like her. Like, she looks so badass. And I think you wrote your email address on a piece of paper and we got in touch quite quickly afterwards. And then I think we lost touch for a few years. And I'm so glad that we reconnected again because we've been able to do field work together, field work in Svalbard, field work in Colombia. So yeah, I'm it's amazing. <laughs> for sure. But so at the time when I met you, you were pretty much a full time mountaineer. No, actually, in that time, I took a break for like just for a climbing for myself to see what I want to do in my life. So I worked for a government in Serbia and I was like, oh, I'm not sure I want to stay all my life in a 
office with the four wall like you know that's not me so i was like okay let's see how nature is beautiful actually and then i start to climb uh, uh, many difficult routes and then i went to north america for a uh, denali and i recognize how glaciers are going so fast melting mm. that is insane like even when you enter to national parks and you see like photo oh this is the glacier not like 100 years ago this is glacier like five yeah. years ago and look now i was like what's wrong what is going on so then i start like to think because mountain gave me so much in my life yeah many friends like you like a life long friends for this life and next three so i was like i should do something for for a mountain for a nature for a glacier so then okay let me go back to the school <laughs> learn more and wow. see what we can do so for yeah. sure but i think it's fair to say that i know you're a very humble person and you don't focus too much on all your achievements but you are one of the very best mountaineers in the world what you've been doing is extremely impressive can you just tell us more a little bit about the mountains you've climbed the mountains you've been guiding on so okay my my story is like i you know <laughs> When they say it's a bird with many different uh, feathers, like colors, <laughs> <laughs> because I was born in a Germany, so 30 years ago, so I'm still on uh, syndrome Peter Pan, so I don't want to grow up. And I grew up in Bosnia on a mountain with my grandparents, and then when the war started in Bosnia, I moved to uh, Serbia. I finished my undergrad in a Belgrade, University of Belgrade and Sangidunum. And then I started to work in a sport industry and I spent all my money, all my time climbing. So I, I started like to climb some local mountains. Then we went to go to Chamonix, to go to of Slovenia. Course, yeah. yeah, so slowly, 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 and then higher, higher, higher. And in one moment they said, okay, do you want to go to Himalaya? And I said, yeah, <laughs> sure. <laughs> empty pockets like I don't have any money like it's so expensive for me in that time and still it is and then they said okay we will find money for you but you need to take care about other people who want to climb so I went to Himalayas maybe 12 times so oh. I climbed Manaslu I climbed uh, Island Peak I climbed many many different mountains and also 2009 we went to climb Everest uh, whew, and then go to South America for a Concagua, oh, to Russia. And crazy. Like all yeah. Around. Yeah. So <laughs> that's that story. And 2015, I said, okay, I should do something else because I want to experience something different. So I sailed across Atl Atlantic Ocean. That's right. Yeah. yeah. What a crazy and, experience this must have been. Yeah. But it's interesting how from a climbing, you go on a sailing and still you're confident in your knowledge because you know knots, you know the biggest portion is to be patient <laughs> because For like, sure. okay, yeah. you're stuck on a small sailboat, like, ah, but that's the same, stuck in a tent, stuck in a Yeah, sailboat. and you know how to respect the environment around you as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but it's, sure. it's so sad. Even I was like, okay, I will not recognize any climate change or anything what happened but what happened in the middle of atlantic it's like a huge field of sea grass because of changing of temperature and everything so all that the environment also showing how like wow. they do, yeah it's so weird i was like is that real like oh i see island in the middle of atlantic and they said oh that's not an island it's seagrass i said like crazy wow. and that was back in 2015 then yeah so all of these experiences i guess all of these observations have led you to become what you're doing today which is you are a doctoral student if that how you call it in the us or a phd student now officially i'm doctoral candidate <laughs> you're <a> candidate right <laughs> And can you tell us more about the, the topic you're working on? Because I think that's absolutely fascinating. So 
entire idea actually came a little bit with you. I was like watching your <laughs> stuff doing in Greenland, doing in Antarctica. And I was like, how I can be part of that without going there. So what are the way people who are not able to see that can have the closest experience? Like where I, sure. if I want to move left and right, is there any chance I can feel that? So I started with my uh, PhD in instructional technology, learning how someone can learn with the use of technology about environment that maybe you are not able to see because it will disappear mm. like uh, glaciers uh, because of, after glo with global warming. So that is how everything starts. So I was uh, looking and reading like every doctoral student, you need to read all <laughs> articles. <laughs> like, <from. laughs> so I, I found that uh, virtual reality stuff like this. Wow, headset, yeah, sure can take you on a place so, like so real that even you can, oh, I feel cold or like I, I want to touch that snow. So I decided to do something different because most of VR, what is done is based on a gaming. So I was like, okay, let's sure. think about environment. Let's think about the climate change because education is the key education can change human mind a lot and i think education the sure. only can help us to solve like to lower everything what is going on with the temperature so how we can show people beauty of a nature that suffers so much because if you tell someone glaciers is melting so like oh i don't know even what is glacier how that look like but That's when true. you put yeah. that and when you see and you can see even calving of glaciers there and in that moment you can see move on the left and right and see waves that make when glacier calves. So, so all idea came from that point, like how we can experience. So then we went to Svalbard for the, for the project uh, for oh, glaciers on the move, on the move yeah, of course. Exactly. Yeah. And I tested with the Yi camera, that is 360 camera, and I really liked. So I was like, oh, maybe this is the way what we can do. And then I moved on a little bit better cameras, 360 VR cameras. So then we filmed, you had the, all of you, you had a chance to see, and still you can go and see our video that we made in uh, Colombia. So sure. thank you, yeah. Jorge, for help us. Dr. Exactly. Jorge. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Shout out to Jorge and Cumbres Blancas, definitely. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. So what is the idea is to show this video around the globe about a glacier that maybe will disappear this year forever. Okay. So maybe that is the only VR. I don't have any uh, information, but I think people can see and experience on the way, the, how they want to see left or right, up and mm. down, explore some stuff with the use of technology. I think it's crazy. The potential of what you're working on is absolutely tremendous because I feel, I don't know if you feel the same, but I'm sure you do that. When we go to these environments, it is such a privilege to be able to travel to these places, to be able to see these glaciers, to, you know, understand the dynamics behind the environments that every time we go back home or we go back to our universities or institutions, we want to tell everyone about it. And we want people to feel exactly the same way, to feel like we were feeling when we were in the field. And before I met you and before you told me about this uh, 360 virtual reality technology, I didn't know that was possible. And actually, the way you do it is very simple. You bring these, they're super high tech, but they're highly transportable 360 cameras. And then what do you do in the field? Can you, can you tell us more about the way you proceed? And perhaps you can tell a bit about the behind the scenes when we were filming in Colombia, for example. Yeah, I, you remember first time when we set up a camera and I moved back. So I set up camera on one stick in, uh, in some area that can cover like uh, its open space. 
And I told Heidi, okay, when you start to talk, <laughs> just pretend you talk to people. And she said, oh, where I should look? And I said, like, just talk naturally. And she was like, oh, but slowly <laughs> later, it was amazing. Like, I, like, people said, it's so good video, and they watch again and again. For sure. yeah. yeah, so... If you haven't seen the video, the video we're talking about is on our website, thelasttropicalglaciers.com. And Nina released it last week, so just a few days ago. So it's about eight to nine minutes long. And this was filmed on the tropical glaciers of Colombia. And please, if you watch the video, send us some feedback. If you've already seen it, let us know. Because you really feel like you're there. You really feel immersed. And when I saw the video again, because we were in Colombia last November, oh, I, all the feelings, all the, the smells, the sounds were coming back. And it felt so great to be able to be teleported again to these tropical glaciers. And do you feel that this technology is going to progress in the future? Do you think that perhaps we will have 360 and VR in every classroom, in every university. How do you see the technology evolving in the future? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. So you remember when we were kids and they said, oh, go far from TV. Don't stand in front of TV so close. <laughs> and then like, don't sit close to your desktop. So that was like maybe 15 years ago. And now in one moment, like you put your screen, uh, if you use cardboard VR, you put your uh, smartphone and you watch. So you have that screen here. So I like, I can imagine my grandma, what would say <laughs> me like with the screen here. For sure. So I think, it's take a time and I think it will change because people like changes, especially sure. in educational settings, people like to implement something new. For example, behind me here, <laughs> what, I'm, what I'm testing now is a smart board. So you remember all of you when you use chalkboard and you write and then ah, that noise. <laughs> So new technology, what we are trying to put in the classrooms, it's a smart board. So you draw, you work all stuff, you can watch videos, you can, now what I'm working on trying with the virtual reality, how that will work. So imagine on that table or board, when you were a kid, like you can watch a YouTube. That's so true. So I think technology is changing so much. It's crazy. I remember... 50, maybe 20 years ago, I was like, I, I knew every new technology that showed up. Like I knew graphical card, numbers, memories, and now I don't know anything. Like it's, it's changing so, so quickly. Yeah. 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 It's insane. Even, even when you look for a, a research, for a studies, what people use in the uh, field, it's also change. Yeah, that's very true. For us, yeah, in science, in glaciology, we have new tools coming pretty much every year. And, uh, and we're always super keen to implement them. But I think what's absolutely great about 360, especially when it comes to glaciers or when it comes to these really remote environments, is that you can film as much as you want with a normal camera and try to show kind of the scale of the landscape and the dynamics on how things work. But if you have a 360 video, you can just like pan around and move around the video. I can be like talking in the corner, but you can be looking behind me, looking what's in front of me, looking at the team working in the background. And I yeah. think that's what I noticed when I watched the video that you filmed in Colombia is that you are, you have this appetite, this curiosity to look around. And sometimes you can just he keep me, you know, leave me to talk in the background, but you can look at everything else. And with the 360, you really get a sense on how the environment is working and how the mountain is interacting with the glaciers, where the water is coming from, where the clouds are coming from. And that's what I really like about this is that it is such a, a dynamic video that you can yeah. really play with it. Can you imagine, I, you just pop up in my mind, can you imagine we have a chance like in a, to see 
something from history in the VR that doesn't exist anymore. So like, yeah. you put VR and you see real dinosaurs, for example. <laughs> That's <laughs> or true. Or any world wonders. I don't know what, what doesn't exist anymore. So how much wow. really would so beneficial to see that? It's not totally. just like, yeah. yeah. And, and, now and what is happened with the glaciers, I think. Yeah, for sure. And, and especially, you know, when we when we talk about what's happening to glaciers, for most people, it's very difficult to understand and to imagine what glaciers look like. You know, to imagine how big they are and to feel like you're there. It's not like you're talking about penguins or whales and people immediately know what you're talking about. But when you're talking about glaciers, it's, I find it's more difficult to make people relate, to make people care about these environments. And I think that's where what you're doing really makes a huge difference because you're trying to find new technologies to make people relate to these environments, to make people feel about what makes these environments so unique. And we know that today the key to solve the climate crisis is definitely education, that this is a big part of it. And that's why in the future, definitely, I really agree with you that VR 360 is going to be a big part of it. Yeah, definitely. Like now even I can see how it's, how it's beneficial when you go to museum and like you put something and like you can see from other perspective. I think it's helped to think about to get some maybe different perspective, to get some idea, sure. to be more creative. I think it's totally new, new world that is coming. Wow, that's Completely true, yeah. And so I think what's important to say also about 360 and VR is that you don't need crazy equipment to watch it, right? No, no. So you can use your smartphone, but uh, what we did, we put our video on a YouTube, uh, but YouTube put uh, out of quality. So to have better like feeling and see it's really important so you need to put on a higher resolution sure. and also there is other ways so, uh, you can watch even on your desktop so when you are in uh, that environment of youtube you can go on the left and the right with your mouse and also this is like oculus go what i use to test and then it's small controller so you can control uh in the video some stuff so the, the next step what i'm planning to do with a video like this one is you can in the video you can control where to go so that is the next step like oh i saw enough of this area let me go <laughs> there so then you will use this small uh joystick and you wow. will move on in another step so that is something what we are working now and we will see how it will go. But for sure, guys, I will, we will keep you posted whatever we do. Wow, that sounds great. And I really love that you're trying to make it interactive because that's one thing that about education and about working with the youth, which we are both, both doing, of course, is that you constantly need to kind of trick them to learn new things. And... We know that the youngsters today spend a huge amount of time playing video games and they love the interactivity of these video games. But if you could be learning something while <laughs> following this incredible 360 adventure and actually decide where you're going, decide on the things you want to learn, decide on where you want to go on the mountain, for sure that would make such a big difference in the way we learn things. Yeah, so what I'm also now I'm testing is to have like where you standing and you talk and whatever, like you talk, it will pop up small quiz, like with uh, ABC, wow. like, oh, so <laughs> is it what is, I don't know, for example, is it tropical area, Karakorum area or <laughs> so. That's areas. brilliant. So people can do like a short quiz also there. So like to wow. test because... Now, what actually, because everything is still new uh, and there is not too many studies, the idea is how much you really learn from VR because you are too excited to be there and you look left. So <laughs> I certainly, look left. yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, because like, oh, I always try to find something on the side, maybe uh, 
filmmakers they made mistakes so that's i was looking oh is there any <laughs> so how much we really learn about that so that is what we are looking but so far our results are really good and really high when we look on that wow that's brilliant and so do you think that in the next videos you will release then you will have a little quiz to really check yeah how much people are actually remembering from the video or Yeah, yeah, that that is the idea. Yeah, so wow. that is maybe maybe what we can do. Maybe Heidi Sylvester, Dr. Sylvester is from <laughs> France, from UK, and you can choose someone other. Just kidding. I think my, my <laughs> app will give it away. <laughs> but that's brilliant because not only you're trying to implement this technology, but you're actually researching how valuable this technology is. It's one thing to be... And I am super excited about VR, about 360, and wanted to do everything in VR and 360. But it's another thing to actually research and do the science behind it and try to understand how much people learn. And perhaps people from different ages will respond to it differently. Uh, people want to be more interactive or less interactive. And I think I'm really looking forward to seeing the results of your studies. Yeah, we need to have like a proof what we are doing actually. And like, I don't want to make people in the trouble. Like they spend so much time in the VR and like that's usefulness. Like, ah, uh, why? So better like let's look from a scientific perspective. So how that is really, th does it really work? So that is like idea of my uh, dissertation. And I hope in a few months I will be done. So we can talk, I can show you my results. And for sure yeah yeah let's see how all will work <laughs> wow brilliant so what what else are you working on because you have this big part on tropical glaciers on distant learning using virtual reality are you testing other technologies at the moment are you working on on other topics in parallel so yeah uh now i'm because all all thing what i'm doing is related a little bit with the technologies So, and also as part of my work, because I'm working in, uh, instruct as instructional designer. So I'm looking how also we can design, uh, distance learning. So that is also focused because like you see now what is happening with this coronavirus. So how students can learn. So that is, mm. that is big question. So that is also what I'm interested to look and to see so we are building platforms so people students can use and learn easily from that and like you it's hard just to read stuff especially now when we are used to it on other technologies so i think distance learning is a future because like you see now what is happening yeah, like we no just doubt. switch overnight on the distance learning and like online learning yeah. instead of face to face so i think There is also, with the use of technology, big potential. Oh, yeah, definitely. I think we all realize the huge need to have material for distant learning. And, you know, at the moment, I mean, it's impossible to do field work. It's impossible to bring students into the field. Uh, it's impossible to travel. And if we can find new ways, new techniques to teleport students into these places without having to move from their homes, That yeah, would that, be that, absolutely that fantastic. Yeah, that is the idea. If we cannot bring students, people, uh, to yeah. to Svalbard, to North Pole, to South Pole, how we can bring South Pole <laughs> to people <laughs> around it. the globe? Yeah, so that's, that is the key. Because I have my friend who uh, with the disabilities, and he always like, oh, I wish I can go with you guys. That is my like wish oh, to see sure. that. So let's think about what we can do for people who, who are not able to go there. Yeah. So I think we can do it. Like, I, I'm sure we can do it. You wow. just need a passion. That's fantastic. <laughs> yes. I think everybody understands why we're working together. Because what Nina is doing is incredible. <laughs> She's so passionate. And I think there is such a big need for researchers, for scientists to communicate about their work and to do it in a very smart way, in a very exciting and innovative way and what you're doing could be useful for so so many of us and one of the best ways to tackle climate change so keep going nina what you're doing is great <laughs> so we got a few questions on instagram before the live started so 
I'm going to speak about these questions. So the first question was from Mahirx. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but the question is about the Colombian glaciers. And we got lucky to be able to travel to Colombia together with the rest of the team from the last tropical glaciers a few months ago. And the question is, what keeps uh, the Colombian glaciers around? And what's crazy is that these glaciers in Colombia are still there. They're trying to survive uh, from one month to another. They're changing extremely rapidly. You know, the, the first glacier we went to uh, is already changing so rapidly. But I think what is saving these glaciers or what is making them survive at the moment is probably the altitude. But we do know that these mountains are not infinite and they're not that high actually in Colombia. And at some point, these mountains will not be high enough for the glaciers to survive. Um, so that's yet another thing that we can share using the technologies you're developing. Uh, but it's crazy when you tell people that there are glaciers in these tropical mountains, these glaciers that try very hard to survive. You have to see it to believe it, right? <laughs> yeah, that, that is insane. Even me. So I'm like 25 years in the mountain around the world. And I know few years ago when you said oh we should go to see tropical glaciers and I was like are you kidding me <laughs> I was like where <laughs> where yeah <laughs> wow that's true yeah so we have another question from Anna and she says how much is the school system ready to use VR for the education on climate change that's a very good question yeah that's really do you funny. think the education system is ready for VR for 360 I think slowly. First, we need like scientific proof that is really good and really works. But I think slowly with demonstration, maybe to show students how that look like. I think like with the computers, you remember how was it like before? Like, oh, sure. you have a computer like that, huge monitors. Exactly. And you had the one. And now like <laughs> every classroom has uh, 25 computers. So I yeah. think it will take a time. But because it's not that expensive equipment and I think it will go faster. But the point is to be included in curriculum. So sure. So that is the key. So we need to show that work to show to instructors, professors, that is useful tools and yeah. For sure. Yeah, that's very true. I think it's also important to build trust in the equipment. You know, we're always talking about building trust in the way we try to communicate, which is very important. But I know that in France, for example, if you tell people about VR in 360, the teachers might be really worried and really scared at the beginning. But if you show the potential, if you try to make it exciting, and if you have the science behind it, backing the fact that this is useful technology, then for sure, in a few years, hopefully it will be everywhere. I really hope so. Um, and then we had a question that was really good from Soheil MHMD. Um, and the question was, how do you think that what we're doing with education and communicating about glaciology and climate change can actually lead to action? Because it's one thing to educate, but do you think that the potential goes even beyond to try to push people into action? Wow, that is also a really good question. Yeah. Oof, I think it, that question is better you to answer. <laughs> I, think, I, think it's, um, I think you cannot be pushed into action without actually being educated about something. You know, we, we always talk about this sentence that you only care about things you, you have learned. And I think you can only be pushed into action for the things that you know about, that the things you've experienced. Yeah. Um, and hopefully, yes, for us, definitely education is a great first step. But if you know enough to be pushed into action, then we have really succeeded. That's the way I see it. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. Because I remember when we talk with Marcella in Colombia, when she said when they show videos to local kids, uh, kids was like, wow, there is a snow up on the mountain yeah. and they didn't 
even believe there is a snow. So like where? There? Close? Like, yeah, you, you can even walk up there. So I think we need to show the world. We need to sh give a voice to these glaciers. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's the goal. And we're going to take so one last question, which is about reforestation. And thank you for this great question. Um, the idea of planting trees in the context of saving glaciers. And greetings from Belgrade. How great is that? Hey. <laughs> <laughs> so Nina, what do you think about this, about these projects which are focusing on, on reforestation? I think who I, in Kenya, if I remember, they, did, they started with this project. And For sure. I think it's work. So they, like a local, they lower temperature because of shadow. They have more grass. I think it's a good way. Honestly, yeah. even to Absolutely. motivate you, there is a one study there said like for a depression or it helps to have a tree around you. That's so. true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Yeah, it helps to feel better and it helps to act against climate change as well. And it's true. This is really something that uh, seems to work tremendously. You write about Kenya. I think there are other places in East Africa as well where they're working very hard on reforestation and not only we do know that forests help to pump a lot of the co2 from the atmosphere but you're right that it creates this kind of microclimate and can really help to bring more humidity to places where glaciers need humidity um, so that's definitely something that is happening i know that some of my colleagues are actually also planting trees in greenland in southern yeah. Greenland. like would you believe it this is insane that it is possible to grow some tiny, tiny forests in southern Greenland. And we do know that this helps definitely. So, yeah, let's, uh, let's all plant trees. Let's focus on one thing and try to do it very well. That's important, to be pushed into action. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Great. Well, Nina, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank is there you. one last thing you would like to share with our brilliant listeners <laughs> so in this moment please save stay safe healthy and be patient so me <laughs> first and i know heidi like we are so like oh we want to go to do we want to go to mountain but in this moment we need all to be really patient and to focus on stuff that we can do in this moment is yeah. like to think about projects and what we can do for us for a society and for world for sure no oh, well Thank you so much. This is a great way to finish this first Instagram live. So next week, we will try to catch the photographer of the team, Antonio Antoine Kremer. So this is likely to be a French-speaking Instagram live, but I really recommend all our French speakers to join you. If you have any further questions, I can see some more coming. Please, please, please do send them either on our Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, on our website. And for sure, we will answer to all of these questions. So I can see the first question coming, but we will find the time to answer all these fantastic questions. Make sure you follow our project, The Last Tropical Glaciers. Make sure you follow what Nina is doing. Her website is www.ninaajanin.com. And thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Thank see you, you guys. Soon. See you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>